So in this video, we're going to start talking a little bit about hydronics and hydronic heating and cooling. Now, as we go through this slide presentation, the slides are a little bit tilted towards the heating side. But let's just keep in mind, and I'm going to remind you several times through here, how this applies to cooling as well. So to begin with, what is a hydronic system? Okay, hydronic heating systems use water or water-based solutions to move thermal energy from where it is produced to where it is needed. The water in the system is neither the heat source or the destination. It's only the conveyor belt. Now let's turn that around a little bit and talk about what it is on the cooling side. A hydronic cooling system or chilled water systems use water or water-based solutions to move thermal energy from where it is not wanted to an area where it isn't ma doesn't matter. So in the heating system, we're putting heat into this conditioned space. In a hydronic cooling system, we're removing heat. But the water in the system is not the heat source or, or the destination. It is only the conveyor belt. Thermal energy is absorbed into the water at the heat source. And it's conveyed through the distribution piping and released into the space by the heat emitter. That's in the heating side. In the cooling side, thermal energy is absorbed by the water in the conditioned space and conveyed through the distribution piping and released into an area where it doesn't matter. Water has many characteristics that make it ideal for such an application. Now, heat emitters are actually really easy. Okay, we have the fin tube. That's your little baseboard heating systems that you see around the bottom of rooms. You have the older style cast iron radiators and you have fan coils. Now fan coils are also ideal for cooling. Why can't I put cool water through the fin tube cast iron? Is because we have condensation that occurs. Remember, anytime we cool air or put a cold substance into a warm, damp environment, it's going to create water or condensation on the outside of it. The fan coils can be set up to have condensate pans. The old fin tube and cast iron radiators cannot, so they are strictly for heating systems. The fan coils sometimes, if they're set up properly, can be used for cooling as well. Water is readily available. It's non-toxic, non-flammable, and is one of the highest heat storage abilities of any material. All three states of water are used in various heating and cooling operation, applications. Remember the three states of water. You have solid, which is ice. You have liquid, which is the water as we know it that runs out of the tap. And you have steam, that's vaporized water. So we have three states of water that we can actually use in heating and cooling applications. The practical temperature range for water in residential and light commercial buildings range from 50 degree Fahrenheit to 250 degree Fahrenheit. At the upper end of this range, water is maintained in a liquid state by, by system pressurization. At the lower end of this range, we can extend it to well below 32 degrees by the addition of antifreeze. So as you can see, because of that temperature range, I can heat and cool a space very easily, uses a single substance and sometimes a single set of piping. The solution that extends to the lower end of the temperatures is called brine. Brine is used in such applications like hydronic snow melting, geothermal heat pump systems, and sometimes in commercial cooling systems. The reason we use brine, it's basically ad addition of salt Okay, is it extends our freezing point. It, water will no longer freeze at 32 degrees if there's a certain amount of salt added to the solution making brine. Early hydronic systems relied on the buoyancy of hot water to circulate water between the heat source and the heat emitters. Remember, as the water, as the um, temperature rises, okay, we have um, the, as the temperature water rises, it wants to go up. Okay, it goes against gravity. Hot water rises, cold water falls. Because it's lower density, the hot water will rise upward from the boiler through the supply piping into the heat emitters. This worked in the older style where the homes, where the boilers were always in the basement and everything went up from there. 
after the heat is dispensed by the heat emitters, the now slightly denser water flows backwards to the boiler. Now this diagram on here is a one pipe steam boiler, same principle. As the steam heated up, it wanted to rise. Okay, it went into the heat emitters, which is the radiators. It condensed and put off heat, and the colder water fell down through the pipes and went back to the boilers. Early hydronic systems required very careful pipe sizing and insulation because of the buoyancy of the water in the system. You had to insulate everything and be, have exactly correct pipe sizing. These guys were true craftsmen that used to install this back in the day. With the introduction of the circulator, it made it possible to move water at higher flow rates through much more elaborate piping systems. We didn't anymore have to rely on hot water rises, cold water falls. There are many different piping configurations. Each are capable of meeting the exact comfort requirements for that application. Some configurations could be as simple as a tank type water heater connected to a loop of flexible plastic tubing for warming a bathroom floor. Other applications can be two boilers that operate in stages, a heating and a, a boiler and a chiller, and so on and so forth. We can also use domestic hot water, we can heat a swimming pool, we can do snow melt, and we can do basically the same thing on the cooling side. Hydronic heating has many advantages. Some of these include comfort, energy savings, design flexibility, clean operation, quiet operation, and non-invasive installation. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about these. Let's start off with comfort. Providing comfort should be the primary objective of any heating system. And please feel free to substitute cooling system in here as well. One major factor that compromises this objective is cost. The average building or homeowner does not spend much time thinking about the consequences of the heating system design. Heating system design affects the health, productivity, and the general contentment of the occupants. Comfort is a major factor. It's your job as the heating system professional to take the time to discuss comfort as well as price with the customer before any decision is made. Maintaining comfort is not just a matter of supplying heat to the body. It's more a matter of controlling how the body loses heat. A normal adult engaged in light activity generates about 400 BTUs per hour. In a typical indoor environment, about 48% of the heat is released by thermal radiation to colder surfaces in the space. Another 30% is released to the surrounding air, and 22% is released from evaporation from the skin. When the interior conditions allow heat to leave a person's body at the same rate it's generated, the person will feel comfortable. If it is released too fast or too slow, that person will feel too hot or too cold. The interior of a building significantly affects the processes by which the body loses heat. For example, most people will not be comfortable in a room containing many cold surfaces, such as large windows, even if the room is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. In order to feel comfortable, the room has to provide proper balance of air temperature, average surface temperature, and relative humidity. A properly designed hydronic heating system can control both the air temperature and the surface temperature. Modern controls of hydronic heating can maintain room temperature within plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit of the desired set point on the thermostat, and this is all done through the controls. An installation of radiant flooring or ceilings will raise the temperature of the rooms. Since the human body is responsive to radiant heat loss, these installations will enhance comfort. There are several factors that determine what is comfortable environment. Factors such as the age of the occupants, the activity level of the occupants, and general health. Okay, did you know that people who are on oxygen always tend to feel hot? That's important to remember when you're looking at the comfort level of the occupants. Depending on the person living or working in the areas being heated, the area may just feel hot, cold, or just right. To accommodate these different factors, zones can be added to the system to help maintain different temperatures through the space. 
Studies have shown that identical buildings can have significant different rates of heat loss based on the type of heating system installed. Buildings with hydronic heat have shown consistently lower energy use than buildings with forced air. Some factors that prove this are hydronic heating systems do not affect room air pressure, air temperature stratification, in other words, different patterns in the rooms make a difference. Hydronic air heating doesn't affect room air pressure. However, forced air system does. This happens when the blower inside the air handler or furnace is operating. Increased room air pressures often result in a lack of adequate return air from the room back to the system. Other factor air temp is air temperature stratification, which means a tendency of warm air rising to the ceiling while cool air falls to the floor. In extreme situations, the difference between air temperature from floor to ceiling can exceed 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Stratification tends to be worsened by things we see in modern construction, high ceilings, poor air circulation, and heating systems that supply air to the room at high temperatures. Hydronic heating systems that transfer the majority of heat by thermal radiation reduce this air temperature stratification and reduce heat loss through ceilings. Comfort can often be maintained at lower air temperatures when the space is radiantly heating. It can lead to a lot of energy savings. We can say the same thing about cooled chillers and chilled water systems. However, we don't use radiant okay, through the chilled water systems. There's no way to do it and capture that condensation in a reasonable manner. Zoning a hydronic system provides the potential for unoccupied rooms to be kept at a lower temperature on the heating side and a higher temperature on the cooling side when not in use. This will also lower heat loss or heat gain and reduces fuel consumption. Hydronic system offers the almost unlimited possibilities to accommodate the comfort needs, usage, aesthetic tastes, and budget constraints of just about any building. A single hydronic system can provide space heating or space cooling, domestic hot water, and specialty loads such as pool heating in the northern climates and sometimes pool cooling in the cooler climates. Such systems can reduce installation costs because of redundant components such as multiple heat sources, exhaust systems, electrical hookups, and fuel supply components are eliminated. It's common for hydronic radiant heating to be used on the first floor of the house, while the second floors are heated using panel radiators or fin tube baseboard. Modern technology makes it easy to combine heat emitters and heat collectors into the same system. A common complaint about forced air heating is its ability to move dust and other airborne particulates, such as pollen and smoke, through a building. In a building with poor quality or poor maintenance, dust streaks collect across ceilings and wall diffusers. Eventually, the duct system will need to be cleaned internally to remove dust and dirt. A properly installed and designed hydronic system can operate with virtually undetectable sound levels in an occupied home. Modern systems that use constant circulation with variable water temperature minimize expansion noises that occur when high water temperatures injected directly into a room temperature heat emitter. Sometimes we have to worry about non-invasive installation. Consider the difficulty involved when trying to conceal ductwork in a home. The best thing that can be done in many situations like this is to encase the ductwork in its exposed soffits. This can often lead to compromising the duct size and or placement. Hydronic heating systems are easily integrated into the structure of most small buildings without compromising their structure or aesthetic characteristics of the space. The underlying reason for this is the high heat capacity of water. A given volume of water can absorb over 3,400 times more heat than the same volume of air for the same temperature change. The volume of water that must be moved through a building to deliver a certain amount of heat is only about 0.03% of that of air. This greatly reduces the size of the distribution piping. For example, a three quarter inch pipe carrying water at six gallons per minute around a hydronic system operating with a 20 degree temperature drop transports as much heat as a 14 by eight piece of duct carrying 130 degree air at 1000 feet per minute.
Okay. Now there's a couple things in here to realize. We always rate water transfer you transportation or volume of water being moved in gallons per minute. We try to have a 20 degree temperature drop. That's from the water temperature leaving the boiler and the water temperature re-entering the boiler on the heating side. Okay, in air movement, we measure the speed of the air at 1,000 feet per minute and we measure volume of air in cubic feet per minute. Now, the tube, the insulated tubing, has a heat loss of about 7 BTUs per hour per, per foot. Insulated ductwork has a heat loss of about 69 BTU per hour per foot. And in a chilled system, this would also be heat gain. Sawing into a floor joist to accommodate the 14 by 8 duct would destroy their structural integrity. Smaller hydronic tubing can easily be routed through the frames, especially if it happens to be one of the several flexible tubes now available. If the distribution system will be insulated, which is code in many areas, considerably less material is required to insulate the tubing as opposed to ductwork. Even when insulated, the same material the heat loss of the 14 by 8 duct is almost 10 times greater than that of the 3 quarter inch pipe. Hydronic heating systems use small, using small flexible tubing are much easier to retrofit into existing buildings than ductwork. The tubing can be routed through closed framing spaces like electrical cable. A typical retrofit strategy is to run 3 8 or half inch flexible tubing from a central manifold to the heating emitters in each room. This allows the ability to maintain different temperatures in each room. This is usually called a home run distribution system. And this is just an example. Again, depending on the heat emitter type and the system itself, heat source or chilled water source, this can be run both heating and cooling. Now with radiators, it's only gonna be heating. But if these were um, fan coil units, could also be used for cooling. In buildings with minimal space, small wall-hung boilers can often be mounted in a closet. In many cases, these compact boilers supply the building's domestic hot water as well as heat. In even more cases, they take up less than 10 square feet of floor area. So as you can see, hydronic heating has a lot of different possibilities. And then when we add the ability to also move chilled water, depending on the system, it even adds to the possibility. So a good thoughtful design can both properly heat and cool a space and provide a lot of comfort to its occupants.